What's going on guys, my name is Matt and this video has been a long time in the making. About a month ago, I decided to embark on the mission of trying to fit a full-fledged gaming PC inside of an original Xbox case. Now I'm definitely not the first person to do this, but I do think I've done a few things with my build that are pretty unique and I think you'd be interested in seeing. Well, most of the PC inside of Xbox mods I've seen either have a full height GPU with an external power brick, or those that do include a power supply inside of the case either use a half height card or an APU with no dedicated GPU. So what I decided to do to really challenge myself was try to find a way to fit both a full height GPU and an internal power supply. First things first, I needed to get my hands on an original Xbox, and preferably a broken one to save money and not be wasteful by tearing down a working unit. What I ended up getting was this broken original Xbox off eBay for $12 including shipping. Luckily the seller was only a few towns over so shipping was really cheap. Once in hand, I started the teardown process. I went through and removed all the parts from this Xbox, some of which were pretty interesting, and interestingly enough, the original Xbox used a custom Intel Pentium 3 CPU and had Nvidia graphics, which is the exact opposite of what modern consoles have with full AMD APUs. I even removed the thin metal internal shell just because I didn't think I'd need to use it, plus it was pretty rusty. Once all the parts were out, I had to make the outer shell as spacious as possible. This meant dremeling off a ton of plastic standoffs and supports. After doing this, I essentially had a blank canvas to build off of. Once this was done, I started to take measurements and plan out a layout for the system. After putting a good amount of thought into it, I decide on a layout where the motherboard and GPU would lay flat similar to a Fractal Design Node 202, and I'd use a Flex ATX PSU behind the motherboard, which based on my measurements was going to be tight, but would fit. I wasn't entirely sure on what components I'd be using in the system, but I knew it wasn't going to be anything crazy. So after doing some research, I went onto Amazon and purchased this 400 watt, 80 plus gold FSP power supply. FSP is a reputable manufacturer, and having 80 plus gold efficiency is nice to see. This unit is non-modular with ketchup and mustard cables, but it works great. The 40mm fan is surprisingly quiet at idle, but it can get pretty darn loud under load, which is why I may do a knock to a fan mod later down the line. Once the power supply was in hand, I started to lay out the parts to see if my measurements were correct in thinking these would all fit fine. And what do you know, it looks like it'll all fit. Now it was time to start constructing a frame for all the parts to mount onto. I'm a big fan of yet another tech channel and his custom case builds and was inspired by his videos to construct my frame out of angle and bar aluminum. Aluminum is a really good material to work with as it's pretty easy to cut and manipulate and it's relatively affordable. I think I spent $12 total on all the aluminum for the build and still had about 20 or 25% left after completion. I started by taking a long piece of angle aluminum and turning it into a U shape to make up the outside of the frame. To make these angles in the aluminum, you simply mark and cut out a right angle where you want the bend to happen, then you simply bend the aluminum up until it creates a right angle. You could cut more or less aluminum out if you're wanting to make different angles, but for this project, right angles were all I needed. I then wanted to square up and support this U shape with the help of some bar aluminum and rivets. Rivets make a semi-permanent connection between two pieces of metal that's relatively low profile. You just line up the two pieces of metal you want to connect together, drill an appropriate sized hole for the rivet you're using, then insert the rivet and squeeze this rivet tool to install the rivet. As you squeeze, the rivet pushes the two pieces together and creates a strong bond. And if you didn't know, rivets are what most PC cases are held together with as they create a strong bond and are pretty cheap. You can get a full rivet kit like this one on Amazon for like $20 and I'll link it in the description down below. I installed two flat bars of aluminum to add structure to the frame and then tested to make sure this still fits snugly within the Xbox case. I then just cut off some of the excess aluminum with the jigsaw. Next came figuring out how to secure the power supply into place. I decided on using a piece of angle aluminum attached to one of the support bars to line it up and keep the main body of the unit in place. This entire process was all just trial and error as there's no real guide to making something like this online. With that being said, all I did was take my time and really try to think things through before drilling or cutting to make sure I was keeping my work to a decent quality standard. Then came marking and attaching a piece of bar aluminum for some of the motherboard standoffs to attach to. 
This was the same as before, just drilling holes then using rivets to adhere the two pieces together. I then drilled an attached motherboard standoff so I could test fit an ITX motherboard. Luckily enough, it fit right into place and seemed relatively square to the frame. To connect a GPU, I planned on using this 16x PCIe riser that I got for under $10 on eBay, which while it does make the card face downward, it also adds a lot more support than a 16x PCIe ribbon cable. The riser slots into the motherboard, then the card slots into place. I needed a way to lift the end of the graphics card up a bit, so I used a couple pieces of aluminum to construct a bracket for the graphics card IO shield to attach to. I then created another bracket so the power supply could be screwed into place. I tried to make the power supply go as far to the side as possible while still keeping room for an ATX power pass through cable which would be routed to the back of the case. Once this was done I did a quick test fit to make sure all the main components fit and I was pleased to see they all fit. At this point, it meant the mainframe for the parts was complete, but the work was far from done. Next, I focused on getting the front panel buttons, LEDs, and I.O. working. For the front panel, I found the pinout online and wired it to a standard set of front panel motherboard connectors. I wired one button to power, one button to reset, then decided to wire both green LEDs to the power LED connector. I soldered and heat shrunk all the wires together, and moment of truth time, it worked first try, both turning on the PC and illuminating the LEDs. Now on to front panel USB. I've seen a lot of people take out these standard Xbox front connectors, but after doing some research, I found these connectors have USB conversion cables. So all I had to do was find the Xbox connector pinout and wire each set to a USB 2 internal connector. This way, I maintain the original look, but can have front panel USB for controllers or other USB accessories. Once this was done, I needed to figure out how to attach the drive bay cover that used to sit centered on the CD drive itself. What I decided to do is machine down a piece of bar aluminum to a similar size as the cover and use it as a spacer. It's clearly not original, but I think it looks nice and matches the silver Xbox logo. Once this was done, the front of the case was complete. I next had to figure out a retention method for the top part of the case. What I decided to do was use some two-part epoxy to attach two bolts to the top panel that will slip through the bottom panel and get bolted in. Two-part epoxy consists of a resin and a hardener that you mix together and letting it cure overnight creates a really strong bond. As you can see, I'm perfectly comfortable with shaking the top cover around with my hand only holding onto the bolt. After creating this retention system, I found these silicone furniture feet I got from Home Depot, screw onto the exposed bolts and actually hold really well. I also added two of these feet permanently fixed in the back with epoxy. I wanted to raise the case up because I made a crude but effective GPU intake in the bottom that I also covered with a basic air filter. This way, the GPU can get fresh air even though it's facing downwards. After I did this, I measured and cut out the back plastic panel to fit around the I.O. Once this was done, it meant it was time for final assembly, which makes this a perfect time to talk about the parts used. I knew I didn't want to go crazy on parts, as this case wasn't going to have great airflow, but I also wanted the specs to still be respectable. For the CPU, I got this i3-8100 for a really good deal at around $80 new, which I found on r slash build a PC sales. This is a really low power chip that still performs really well with 4 cores and 4 threads on Intel's latest platform. The CPU operates at 3.6GHz which is decent for a locked chip. For the motherboard, I knew I had to go ITX and I also wanted to have Wi-Fi to match a console's ability of Wi-Fi also. Modern new ITX boards can get really expensive, but after doing some deal hunting, I won an auction for this MSI B360i Gaming Pro AC. This is a non-overclocking motherboard, but this board does have a lot of bells and whistles. This board, like many used motherboards, didn't come with an I.O. shield, which was fine because I wouldn't have used it anyway for this build even if I had it. To cool the CPU, I wanted something a little better than the Intel stock cooler that came included with the i3-8100, so I ended up using a Cryorig C7 that I had laying around, which is one of the best sub 50mm CPU coolers on the market. Cryorig even makes an all copper version now, which is pretty cool. For memory, I just used a 2x4GB kit of Team Group DDR4 at 2400MHz. 8GB is good for most games, and Intel doesn't need super fast RAM, so this worked fine at 2400MHz in dual channel operation. 
For the GPU, I went with this 4GB RX480. This is an HP OEM card and is actually the only ITX RX480 model ever made. I got this card a few months back and actually have a full dedicated video on it, which I'll link in the card above and description. It has a single fan with a semi-open design and performs just as well as any non-OEM RX480. For storage, I decided to go with a 256GB ADATA SU800 for around $30 on sale. This is my go-to budget OS drive as it has DRAM, performs well, and goes on sale for a good price relatively often. Like I said before in the video, I'm powering the system with a 400 watt 80 plus gold Flex ATX power supply from FSP. Another good option is the modular Flex ATX units Geek Cells, which I've heard decent things about. Either way, all the parts mentioned will be in the description down below. Final assembly went pretty smoothly. Trying to fit all these components and cables into the system definitely isn't easy and is hard to make look super clean. But in the end, I was able to do it without any cables interfering with fans. Once I got it all together, I took a step back and was pretty happy with how it looks and how it turned out. It definitely doesn't look stock with the silicone feet and aluminum spacer, but I think it does look decent and doesn't look too far from the original Xbox. Obviously, the back doesn't look original at all because of the PCIO. Once it was all put together, I decided to test some games. These games include Rainbow Six Siege, Far Cry 5, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Overwatch, and Apex Legends. This would be a decent system for emulation, but for this video I just stuck with PC titles. But if you'd like to see me try some emulation on this PC, let me know in the comment section down below. So starting out with Far Cry 5, at 1080p high settings, this system produced an average of 67 FPS with 1% lows of 36. This was decent performance, but the 1% lows were a bit lower than I prefer. Moving on to Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p high settings, this system averaged 104 FPS with 1% lows of 78. I'm absolutely awful at this game, but the system, from what I can tell, gave a pretty good experience. Moving on to Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p medium settings, this system averaged 66 FPS using the built-in benchmark, and again the 1% lows were disappointing at 28. Next up is Apex Legends at 1080p with most things set to high. This system produced an average of 97 FPS with 1% lows of 73. This was a pretty decent experience and would allow someone to stay relatively competitive. Finally, the last game tested was Overwatch and in this game, performance was kinda disappointing. At 1080p ultra settings, this system averaged 66 FPS with 1% lows of 33. This was a fine experience, but I thought the system would produce better results. Overall, I think the performance of this system is pretty good, but when I looked back at the gameplay, I found in some instances the GPU was reaching 83 degrees, which I'm pretty sure is the point at which an RX 480 starts to thermal throttle. With that being said, I don't think I saw the CPU go above 50 degrees, and in a game like Rainbow Six, both the CPU and GPU stayed around the mid 40s. I could probably remove the fan and plastic shroud from the RX 480 and slap on a beefy Noctua fan to try and fix the issue, but until I start cutting vents in the top, airflow is never going to be great. Overall, I'm pretty proud of this system as it's the first time I've done any case fabrication like this, and it makes me more confident in doing a project I've been wanting to do for a while, which is build an entire PC case from scratch. This Xbox mod definitely doesn't look the best, but I like it and hope you guys like it too. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up, I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up, as well as consider subscribing for more PC and tech related content in the future. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.